summer school, I think. Um, you should be very proud of yourself to be in this intense course, courses, I mean. Uh, so let me, I, I, I said yesterday that uh, uh, it should be easy to prove that for, if the underlying state is product state, then the twist product will, will, will the correlation function that looks like a, I, I'm sorry, the, the function that looks like a correlation function but based on a not the, the usual product but based on the, the twist product will vanish. Um, it's not too trivial, so I thought I would explain with the proper reference. You can read a little bit general situation in the, in the, in the paper of mine. Um, so let's just remind you, we, we, we asked the question whether the torical state on a sphere, which is non-degenerate, I mean the, there's no encoded qubit in this situation, can, can, can we generate this state using unitary circuit uh, where the circuit is a small depth? The answer was no, it takes linear depth. And the reason uh, was not so trivial. The, all the previous techniques just failed, so we had to introduce a new, new one, and the one uh, ingredient was to think about the twist product. Uh, we managed to show that the twist product is uh, uh, covariant under this uh, small depth quantum circuit conjugation. And you really need, the, you, you really need this. Um, so let me just explain the lemma. Suppose we are working with a product state and there are two stabilizers, not poly, not potentially non-poly, stabilizer. You know, stabilizer mean, just means that if you multiply P, then it is just uh, the eigenstate of, with eigenvalue one. And they are supported on the, the annulus region I drew. So the P is supported on this annulus and the PQ is supported on that, the other annulus. And the second condition is somewhat non-trivial. I, 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 I only want to think about the stabilizers, non-poly possibly, uh, that are themselves a shallow quantum circuit. The, in the Tory code case, the string operators, the one particular stabilizer, poly stabilizer, happens to be a quantum circuit of depth one. But I want to consider everything, but under the condition that is shallow circuit. Then you can show that this test product, no matter what P and Q are, as, as long as the three assumptions are made, then this must be one. Individually, uh, without, without this term, then P is a stabilizer, so the correlation function, the second term in the correlation function is one, so they will vanish. So why is that true? Um, so here is the argument, calculation. Well, so yeah, this is the expression I want to evaluate. And the observa observation is that Q itself is a quantum circuit of small depth, so it has a small light cone. And the product state is entirely specified by the local projections. If I tell you, oh, in this state, I don't know how entanglement it is, but in this state, this qubit is in the zero state, and that qubit is in the zero state, and so on, that fully specifies the Understein state. So if I look at the, the bigger circle here, and I know that if this part is product state, underlying is all zero, and then I apply Q, it may not stabilize the underlying state because I only know that the underlying state is product state on this small region. Outside, I don't know. But still, still, it is a small depth quantum circuit. Uh, the observable sitting in, at the smaller circle can, be, can only be affected by the larger uh, patch. So in particular, if I apply a, you know, the, the operator that tells me, oh, this middle qubit is in the zero state, that projector will still be telling me after the uh, application of Q that the underlying state at that position is, is in the zero state. And this argument applies everywhere. So in other words, I can pull up one projector, uh, a single qubit projector acting on a single site here and bring it closer to Q. Even though P and Q are in a funny uh, uh, linked diagram product. So you, you pull up all those, all those projectors, then for Q, for, for this, uh, from the viewpoint of Q, it only sees pi. It has all the information to stabilize the underlying state. So Q will evaluate, will be absorbed into this uh, product state, but there, it's just identity. So it disappears, and you are evaluating P. So 
Well, P was assumed to be a stabilizer, so it, it, it vanishes. Well, it, it, the, the value is one. Okay, so the, the lemma is, is proven that way. You know, the second condition was crucial. Now, how do you use this for the sake, for the complete, completing the argument for the complexity? You remember the, uh, the identity, this. So fixing the state, I change the observable. And if P and Q satisfy all these three conditions, it will, the evolved, time evolved version by a, some small depth quantum circuit U, which is unknown to me, will still be satisfy these conditions on the evolved state. So with respect to that, that state, I have another set of those. And for those, I, I still know that uh, it, it has to be valued to a zero a twist correlation function. And it should continue to hold as long as I have this shape. And this shape fails to be true when the circuit depth is so big that uh, you no longer have a separation between these supports and you, you, you no longer have a, a separation between these two crossing points. So that's the, so you, since you're considering all possible operators and then you, you show that it's vanishing, finding one non counter example to this shows that the underlying state cannot be this. So that's why you, you, you prove the inequality between the potentially evolved state uh, from the toric coast. Okay, any questions? Yeah. YQ what? YQ pi is equal to pi here. Oh, so, mm. so the, by, since uh, Q is looking at only local patch to determine the local projector, I could uh, pull up uh, local projectors here as long as Q is bottom of the P. If, it is Q, if Q is above P, then I can pull up the projector from this side by the same argument. So you eventually collect all the projectors that will ensure that that will suffice you to evaluate the Q value. The geometry is used. I am using the fact that, oh, if I look at this region, then I only see Q. If I look at this region, then Q is sitting on top of P, so I can pull up the projector from the left side. If I look at this side, Q is below P, so I can pull up the projector from, the, uh, from below. So uh, let's begin the fourth hour. The topic is the triorthogonal codes. Um, so let me begin with the super basics uh, remark. Why people care about Clifford's plus T architecture? There are many universal gate set, and the Solovic type theorem says that, oh, uh, any single cubic unitary can be synthesized by some pretty much arbitrary generating set. That's fine. And as long as we have a complete SU2 unitary group and uh, some entangling gate, we generate everything. And the overall uh, gate complexity only differ by poly log factor. No big deal. But why do we care then about Clifford and plus T? It's because of the fault tolerance. For other schemes, it's highly non-trivial how to make sure that every operation is accurate. But for Clifford plus T, we have developed a full theory of polystabilizer code to implement the Clifford part reliable. And then, here's a non, the, the non-trivial idea by Manik, Neil, and Bravi, uh, Sergei, Bravi, and Alexei Kitaev pioneered that we can distill one non-trivial, uh, non-Clifford state with which we can complement the Clifford operation to make a universal case set. That's the reason, because T is important only because of the fault tolerance. So T state is nothing but this. So yeah, this benign looking single qubit state uh, is acting behind all the uh, quantum advantages and interesting phenomena that you can see in the, behind the quantum computing. Mm. 
So let me remind you how to use this. Um, you start with the T state. And then you bring out some arbitrary data qubit. And then you measure C and Z. Easy. And then you measure X and X. And depending on the measurement outcome, you can do some Clifford operation. And the result is that psi is as if the T gate was applied. Well, the calculation is not that difficult, so let's do it. Then you don't have to do it again, ever again. <laughs> so T state is here. And say arbitrary qubit state is here. And it suffices to consider a single qubit because by linearity, even if the single qubit is entangled with something else, the result will hold. If I measure, say, ZZ outcome was plus one, and I, I will be projecting onto a component that looks like this. So alpha zero zero times beta. And then I measure out the, the second qubit, the ancilla, in the x basis. And suppose I get plus one result, then plus state has the same overlap with zero and the same overlap with one. And plus is. Yeah, so the, the amplitude are, the, are exactly the same. So if you project onto the plus state, then they just gone and you're left with the correct phase vector inserted at the correct position. And it's left to you to figure out what happens if I had a minus output or if I had a minus output there. Uh, one remark, uh, these measurements are reversible measurements in the sense that you don't ever destroy your quantum underlying quantum state. And if you wanna go back, then you can't. Well, you know, so this is another instance of the exercise we had the, 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 on, on, around that board before. There, you know, if there's a stabilizer group, if you measure some non-logical op non operator, then exactly one generator is kicked out and a new measurement is coming in. The same thing is happening here. Can you write again the, the circuit? The oh. Everything is measurement. So now this is thrown away, and this is goes away. And there is uh, some classically controlled Clifford unitary that you have to apply, you know, depending on the measurement. Yeah. Now, we want to talk about the coding. So we, we want to talk about how to distill a T, a T states. And for that matter, Let's think about the noise model first. Um, the T state is a one state in a two-dimensional qubit Hilbert space. What's the orthogonal state? Um, it's going to be the Z times T because, yeah, they, 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 they are orthogonal. So if I, if I write down um, <coughs> the most general uh, state that, that is possibly noisy in this basis, then I would have a majority of weights on this true state. And by tracing pri trace preserving property, I must have epsilon there and something there. Well, potentially, it, the density matrix would, would, would look like this. And here comes the a neat trick of Clifford twirling. So I'm, I'm building up the motivation why we consider a specific class of codes, and this is the reason behind. So Clifford twirling maps this density operator down to diagonal density operator. How do you do that? Well, the channel is this.
So this is a concrete channel that you actually want to implement. So with a probability half, so you are, uh, you are implementing your, your, your quantum computer and there is a completely random classical bit, you toss your coin, if it is heads up, then you do nothing. If it's down, then you apply this unitary. But what is this unitary? This is a stabilizer, non-Pauli stabilizer of the T-state. Um, yeah. This was, so, you know, you can directly see why, why that is a T-state. Um, and this is Clifford. Um, for the sake of completeness of this course, mini course, let me just briefly tell you about the, the Clifford hierarchy. So it's a hierarchy, so I, I'm building up a, a set of unitaries in that fashion. Level one is just nothing but the Pauli group. That's level one. Uh, you may think, you may wanna call it level zero, but there's a good reason that it just start with the one, and you will see later. <laughs> uh, and then level K is inductively defined. Uh, level K is a set of unitaries on a, on a whatever, whatever number of qubits you have, such that for all Pauli operators, U conjugating P results in the level, uh, level K minus one set. So you pick up a unitary from here, conjugate any arbitrary element there, then the level goes down one by one step. So at level two, this is Clifford, and level three and so on, and it goes all the way up to infinity. Mm. One remark is that only level one and two are a group, everything else is just a set. Why? Uh, in a simple argument. If it were a group, then it will in particular contain um, this particular element, this is Clifford, you can calculate. And uh, you, since you have a Clifford and T, you can generate dense subset of SU2, and it is a group, so, which means you can approximate arbitrary elements of the SU2. Um, right, but that's not gonna happen because these groups are discrete. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is level level one. So le level one is distinguished. This is a, this is a start starting point. Everything else just follows from that. So that yeah, T belongs to level three. Mm. Okay. So. I left you an exercise to show that actually this, this Pauli twir Clifford twirling is automatically done by the injection circuit. Uh, that's a nice feature about this. So you don't ever have to, well, in, in practice, have to implement this. The, the randomness of measurement automatically does the job of the flipping coin for you. Um, so then, my effective reduced density matrix for the possibly noisy quantum circuit, uh, I'm sorry, possibly noisy T state, is either the perfect state or the, 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 the Z version, Z contaminated version of T. So all I have to do is to catch those errors. And for that purpose, a one infinite family of codes is known, which is called the triorthogonal codes. So before I define triorthogonal codes, I'm going to define triorthogonal matrix. It's a binary matrix. So there are k rows and s rows. For the convenience, I just separate it into two pieces. And the number of columns is going to be n, the number of qubits. 
You know, it's a matrix, binary matrix is called triorthogonal, if the following is true. These rows have all the weight. These rows have even weight. That's the first condition. Second condition is self-orthogonality. If you pick two rows, say um, V A, uh, yeah, V A and V B, the upper superscript denotes the row index. That's my convention for this hour. And you take everything, you, know, you, you take a dot product, then sh this should be zero mod two. Okay, just a usual self orthogonality for the, um, uh, over the binary field. The third condition is interesting. Sum over J, V, J, A, V, J, B, V, C, it's a triple of left. You, you take a bitwise end of the three rows, all distinct, then it should be zero mod two. So this is another in instance where two is very different from three. Well, like a three set is empty complete, but two set is easy. Two local community Hamiltonian problem is easy, three local harder, and so on. So, and this is another instance. And well, to be frank, Calculation with, uh, oh, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, th this is definition of triorthogonal matrix. Now, triorthogonal code, on the other hand, uh, is defined by the triorthogonal matrix by declaring that, oh, my bit string on this row is going to be my x logical operator and z logical operator. That makes sense because they are odd weights, so uh, their overlap is always odd, so they anti commute then different rows will commute because of the second condition. And I declare that this row, each row here, will generate X stabilizer. And then the Z stabilizer will be just orthogonal complement of all the rows here. Okay, that's the maximum choice you can make. That's it. So it's very rigid in the sense you know, usually when you, when you talk about polystabilizer codes, there's a freedom for you that you can choose the logical basis. It's up to you what operator you, you call it logical X, but here I am specifying that particular logical operator. So yeah, so the corresponding CSS code is called a triorthogonal code. Um, calculation with the triorthogonal code is not easy. In particular, how do you show a certain code admits a transverse of T? You are no more in the poly world. You have to deal with the, all the phase vectors and signs and so on. It's difficult. Um, so there's a subclass of triorthogonal code that I am going to focus on this hour, and I, that, that is called the, uh, this, this is my terminology. Let me know if you have better one. Level three divisible. So this one has a cleaner definition, at least. So I'm gonna consider a subspace of some number of bits. It's a vector space of dimension M. I'm gonna consider a subspace. And I'm gonna pick a, 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 a vector whose entries are plus minus one or plus minus three. Okay, that sounds weird. Why, why would you care one and three? But you will see why. Uh, these are the odd numbers modulo eight. Um, so with respect to this V, uh, I'm sorry, with respect to, to this T, V is called level three divisible if whatever you vector you give me, I enumerate the coordinates zero and one, and I insist that these are integers. Mathematically, that's a weird thing to do. I mean. You know, F2 is an equivalence class of integers modulo 2. So formally, it's a you know, all set of all odd numbers or set of all even numbers. Here, I insist that the set of all even numbers is represented by integer 0. 
instead of all odd numbers is represented by integer one. So I promoted the, the quotient equivalence class into the vanilla integers. And then I take, uh, I enumerate the these t vector, t1 and da da da, tm, and I take a dot product, okay? So remember this component is an integer, I sum it over, and I insist for the, this definition that it is zero modulo eight. The level three comes from the fact that eight is a, a two to the three, okay? So, and it's left to you to show, to show that if you have any generating matrix for V, then that generating matrix is, uh, is an instance of triorthogonal matrix. Um, okay. So let's build up, well, now, the, the, uh, any uh, level three divisible code gives rise to the triorthogonal matrix, so I can think about the triorthogonal code, but it's boring code, kind of, because I don't have any odd weight rows. Well, this equation tells me that, well, T is always odd. So if I take the equation modulo two, then it just means that everything is even weight. So there's no encoded qubit in the corresponding triorthogonal code. But let's study that trivial space first. So I'm going to show that uh, that zero, uh, uh, that, that code that encodes zero, num zero logical qubits will have uh, some e unique uh, uh, code state. And I'm claiming that, so there are m, m qubits. And according to t, I apply t to the power there. So if t1 was plus one, I apply t. If T2 was minus three, then I apply T to the minus three and so on, dot, dot, dot. So every component, since T are all odd number, every component is some uh, Clifford matrix times T, okay? So this is my, uh, my, my, my thing. I wanna show this. And how can I do that? Well, if you are too confused, always you expand it in you know, a more familiar thing. Um, let's start with the all zero. Well, if I have all zero, then all the z-stabilizer will be satisfied, so I don't have to worry about that. Then the code space projector onto the code space will, apply, will, will have form like this, G, where G is the stabilizer group consisting of all X operators. Uh, no, properly normalized, but let's not worry about the no normalization. So this one, will make, we will turn this uh, uh, zero into the bit string specified by the bit vector element G. And that ranges over all the uh, level three divisible space V, right? Now I apply T. Okay, then what happens? T is, um, right, T is inserting this phase vector whenever it says one. So, and T to the some power will insert this phase vector to that exact the same power. So, here, the phase vector we pick up will be g to the i pi over four, t i v i. That's the phase vector I pick up. Now, here the, the weird promotion is in action. V was a binary bit, but when it comes to this equation, this is a literal integer. Right? Uh, now, okay, so yeah, pi should have been two pi in all literature, but unfortunately history is not. So two pi over eight it is. 
Now, what's the condition for the level three uh, divisibility? This sum is zero mod eight. So this guy, I mean, yeah, yes, it's one. So this equality is now checked. Um, now, now let's do, well, this is perhaps amusing to you. Yes. It is a non 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 Clifford stabilizer, not even a Pauli, of course. Now let's uh, imagine a particular. Uh, well, let's assume more towards that V. Suppose I have a generating matrix for the V, where I mean, the, you know, put, put differently, let the row span of a binary matrix be the V, okay? With respect to sort some, some, some T here, some T vector. And suppose I have some ones, how many, we'll say K, and I think about the block decomposition of this matrix, and, and suppose that I have got zero and some other bit strings in here and there. This is not too restrictive, because uh, whenever you Make a, you, you receive a, a, a generative matrix, you take a Gauss elimination to find the row echelon form, then you will typically have this identity up to, your, well, you will always have this identity well, in this form up to per, row uh, column permutations. Clear? Now I want to interpret this. So let this collection of bits be, uh, uh, say, uh, I don't know, a piece, and let this be B part. So set of the, the qubits according to the columns of this matrix. Then what's, the, my, what's my, the code state there, the psi there, has a bipartite state between A and B. It has a stabilizer. It is uniquely spe uh, specified uh, 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 stabilizer state by a set of stabilizers that looks like, that is specified this matrix. And what, is, what does it do? Um, this is an XL, X operator, so I'm gonna call it X1, X1 bar. No reason, no particular reason, I just insist that I just write it this way. So A and B, and so in, in general, uh, for I that much, and some identity acting here, and some something in B, B, B piece. And also there is a Z type stabilizer because my orthogonal, uh, triorthogonal code con insisted that I take uh, the orthogonal complement for the Z side. So in the stabilizer group for this state, I also have Z I A and Z I B bar. I wrote it bar, but it's really a, uh, so and whatever operator you, you, you have on, on, on that part. Is that clear? Now let's interpret again without calculating anything. If I just delete these number, number of columns and in, in look, just look at this, then all these conditions are satisfied. The identity matrix part, if you take a, bitwise overlap, they will just cancel off. There's no repeated ones along one column. So self-orthogonality is okay. Tri-orthogonality is okay. The only exception is the, the first part. Oh, I, I, I demanded the first K be odd weight. But if I just look at the right-hand side, these consist of odd weight rows. They consist of even weight rows, right? So. This piece precisely defines uh, some triorthogonal code encoding k qubits. And xi bar is precisely the logical operator of that triorthogonal uh, code. And zi is also the, the logical operator. Everything else is just a stabilizer on acting on this b part only. There's no support on, on a side. So, this state is nothing but 
some k number of unprotected qubit and k logical qubit encoded in a tri orthogonal code forming k bell pairs. Clear? Yes. Uh huh. No, the other, the other way around. The top part is odd weight. You, this part is even. Odd minus one. Um, Right, so, yes, oh yeah, thanks, yeah. So yes, so this, this thing is like you had a k qubit and some encoded qubit, everything is now maximally entangled with a sum, well, with a, a specific logical qubit in that triorthogonal code. Now, this calculation says that if I apply t to the t1 and da, 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 t to the tk, and some transversal operation t, you know, say tilde, then I get invariant state. Now, forget about what, what happens here. When does bell pair remains invariant? When you apply it by a unitary that is bipartite. When the, right, so, If this is the k, oops. If this this equality holds, then v transpose must be u inverse. Uh, did I get it right? Yes. So they are basically the same thing. So, in other words, uh, the transpose of t applied according to the prescription of my t vector, small t vector, is enacting precisely the the opposite of this T operation, which is evidently applying T gate on a particular qubit. Therefore, I conclude that um, if I take a level three divisible code, making a generating matrix, rearrange the rows and columns in such a way that there is an identity matrix on the top left corner, read off the right block, construct a triorthogonal code, then the resulting code admits a transversal T. Uh, yes, that's, that's the next, next thing I'm going to say. Okay, okay. So remember, you know, due to the, the Pauli, I'm um, sorry, the Clifford twirling, our error model is purely Z. Yeah, all the Clifford operations are assumed to be perfect, and the, all our, uh, uh, the goal is to catch the Z errors upon the uh, acting these Ts. So whatever error you may have here, when you apply the T gate, well, T, pass, T piece will just pass through. It, is, it implements something useful for us. Z part remains, and that's exactly the same as, as if you had a code and Z errors are happening. So if you just do the usual error correction procedure for the triorthogonal code, you will be able to catch those Z errors. All that matters in this business is the X stabilizer because they are going to catch the Z errors. So if the triorthogonal code has a large z distance, then you're in good shape. So, well, <laughs> I just spoke it uh, in words, but so yeah, k, k qubits apply an encoding map into a triorthogonal code. Well, we only verified for the with a, a slightly small class where it is coming from the th level three divisible. Um, apply transversal T and then inverse encode. I say inverse encoding instead of decoding because decoding is used somewhat differently in the quantum computing literature. Decoding usually means that you only correct errors, but I literally mean the inverse unitary that you, inverse isometry that you have here. You do it inverse, then you are left with the some k bits and some syndrome qubits. And if they are 
reporting no errors, then you use this. Then that's the distillation protocol. Okay. So let's now examine one important example that, is of, that comes in an infinite family, and that is the color code in three dimensions. Yes. Oh, so yeah, let, let me emphasize again. All Clifford operations are assumed to be perfect. There's no error is going to occur in this encoding step or there. The only possible position where error might occur is in this transverse of T insertion because you are going to use the faulty uh, T gates or faulty T state. And there, because of the uh, Clifford twirling technique, we, we may assume the error model is purely stochastic Z error. So all, all that remains is to catch those Z errors. And upon, okay, uh, uh, if the syndrome says okay, then just you can use that. Yeah. And Otherwise with the, can you correct? sorry? Otherwise can you, correct you could correct, but there's little motivation to correct because since everything is uh, uh, perfect, except for that Z error, rejecting gives you a higher quality. And rejection probability is not that high. Well, you have to work in the region where rejection probability is not high. Acceptance is high. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, rejection is low. <laughs> yes? Uh, is the no uh, No. Because oh. we don't care. I mean, Right, in, yeah, Clifford operation that assumed to be perfect, so we don't care about that point. Yeah. So this is an example. Uh, and here comes some of a, a topological element. Um, color code in 3D, uh, let's assume that we have a tessellation of Euclidean sp three space. Oh, yes. We do have these stabilizers. Ah, uh, Z stabilizer is assumed, well, well uh, Z stabilizer is whatever it can be. It, it should commute with the X logical operators and it should com commute with the Z stabilizer. So that's just the you know, kernel of this matrix as an operation from right to left. So everything in that kernel is declared to be Z stabilizers. Yes. So, they yeah. so all the data is in that matrix. Um, yeah. So you, know, you pick your favorite uh, four colorable tessellation of, uh, of R3. Four colorable tessellation means that you, know, you are filling your uh, uh, three space using volumes that are touching each other and you color it, you assign a, a number uh, one out of four in such a way that no neighboring volumes have same color. That's all. Uh, existence, yeah, there, there exists, and there are some general considerations we can talk about. If you were in the problem session like a two times ago, then uh, yeah, there's a, uh, there's a working prescription you can take. So we, let's just assume that, that there is one. And then the definition of the color code is that I assign X stabilizers for every three cell, oh, I'm sorry. The qubits, qubits are on vertices. So it's a, so the, the color tessellation gives you a cell structure. There is a volume, there's a phase, there's a line and a point. Every point you put a qubit. And X stabilizer is going to be the product of X around all the vertices for a given uh, uh, three cell. And Z stabilizer is assigned to every two cell. Question? Yeah, this is the definition. Um, so now, uh, oh. Um, 
there's an interesting calculation that I thought I would do, but I don't have time, so let me just state it. Um, I gave you the definition of divisible code in terms of, oh, well, for every uh, element in the vector space, this dot product must be zero. How do you check that? Efficiently. That's, in general, a hard problem. But, but because we are uh, restricting the, the uh, level, it becomes an easy, efficient, there's an efficient algorithm. Um, okay, so let me state the proposition. So it's a condition on the generating matrix. First condition, t dot some row A is zero mode eight. V A is a one row here. Number two, t dot V A dot V B is zero mod four. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm using the previous promotion. Any binary bit is promoted with a genuine integer. Number three, t dot is mod two. So you, you see the clear pattern. Every time you add in more uh, uh, component to a bitwise add-in, you reduce the modulo thing by a factor of two. So, and well, there are only, yeah, row worth of these conditions to check, row squared, row cubed. So it, this is efficient. Mm. Yeah. Uh, in the in the lecture note, you can, there 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 is there, there is a calculation to show why this is the case. Um, so okay, so let's apply this criteria for this uh, uh, 3D color code. Um, okay, so first thing we have to define we have to find the t. But how do we define the t? One observation, well, crucial observation is that the, vertice, the vertex set of this four colorable tessellation of a free space is bipartite. When is graph bipartite? So it's a, it's a general fact, when, when is bipartite? Right, even all, if every cycle is even length, then it's bipartite. Um, what is a cycle in this, in, this, in this lattice? It will go through some edges and go here and there and come back. Right, so it actually depends on the fact that the first homology of, of my R3 is zero. Therefore, any closed loop is coming from the boundary of a two chain, and two chain here is uh, some two cell. So it suffices for us to check that every two cell comes with the even number of edges. But why is that? Every two cell is a boundary of a three cell, so like, I don't know, some, 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 some two cell is a boundary of a three cell. Now this face is a unique bo joint boundary between two, exactly two, because of the colorability of two different colors. Now an edge is going to be the intersection of three three cells. Uh, you know, you, you, you think about the, your blowing uh, the, the bubble and you make a three spheres and there's a vertical line that goes on. So one edge is going to be bound, joint boundary of three, exactly three cells. But how many, how, 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 diff how many different kinds of three cells can I bring to see an edge? Here, one color is, color A is fixed. Here, here color B is fixed. There are two remaining colors because we're working with a four color for lettuce. And uh, since no same color can be repeated, as you go along this loop, the color of the remaining two must alternate. So therefore, the, uh, this is even length. Therefore, the, the graph is bipartite. So now the T vector is defined by that bipartition. On the one, by one, one party, you assign plus one. The other party, you assign minus one. OK, we got the T. Now we can check this. Um, 
So T dot, the first condition is a T dot VA. Now VA is the, this one. It's a, it's a three cell, and we have to show that the dot product between the T and V is zero. I'm actually gonna show the, the stronger statement that for every vertex in, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a three cell, there is an equal number of plus one and minus one. Why is that? Here's my three cell, here's, you know, there are some two cells you know, going on. And this three cell itself is com comes with the one color. Therefore, the two cells on this three cell come is, a, is, is a three colored tessellation of a sphere. So you, you can think of the, the it's, a, it's a generally like, the general situation is like this. This, this, this thing is repeated, it's three colored. Now pick one color, say one, and think about the collection of all uh, union of uh, co uh, color one cells. So color one is here and maybe here. They cannot be adjacent because of the colorability. And there could be here and so on. And this union contains, well, gives a partition of my vertices. There's no repetition, and every vertex belongs to at least one uh, uh, plaquette. Well, obvious from the picture. But for every plaquette, it goes along the one cycle. There's, a, there's an even cycle, so there's an equal number of plus and one and minus one. Therefore, on the whole three cell, there is equal number of plus one and minus one. Okay, great. What about the second? It means that I should take an intersection of two three cells, which means I work with a two cell, two dimensional cell, but we just argued that there is equal number of plus one and minus one. Great. What about the triple intersection? When do you have a triple intersection of, of three three cells? If they are far apart, they cannot intersect. If they are very close together, they can only intersect along an edge. But, hmm? Sorry? They share a vertex, but they also share a, an edge. It's a three color rule lattice. But the edge consists of two vertices. One is plus one, the other is minus one. Okay, great. So, yeah, the, by the choice, the choice of T according to the bipartition gives us the, the color code to be the level three divisible. Mm. One example actually comes with a boundary. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna draw all the edges in white if they're on, the, they on the face of this te tetrahedron, um, and red if they belong to the, if they are inside. Something like this. So there are four three cells. Um, it's bipartite. There are exactly 15 points, and you can assign T as according to the prescription. Um, and this is divisible at level three. And this is the the famous code 15, one, three, triathlon. Um, there are nicer pictures than my drawing on the on the internet, so go ahead and look it up. It is useful for metric state distillation. Metric state is a is a, a generic name for well, a T state is an example of metric state. Uh -huh. um, and distillation, yes, well, yeah, this 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 is a this distillation procedure. Uh, usually it's used just for that. Oh, there's a, it's, it's largely unexplored. Okay. For non triorthogonal codes, general polystabilizer codes, well, now we have a good LDPC codes. Triorthogonal codes, we, we don't even know if there is a good triorthogonal code. Um, oh. I was, yeah, let me, let me use like a five minutes. 
to do some, some theory piece. actually back to the first hour. I'm going to show, oh, oh, oh yeah, first. We, we worked on the three dimensions. You may wonder, ah, that's too high. <laughs> uh, so you may wonder, uh, can we find something nice in the two dimensions? The answer is no. Let me, let me, let's understand why. OK, so here, here we are working with the Pauli stabilizer code in two dimensions, local, the, the usual sense of my uh, four hours and assume the most strong uh, uh, error correcting criteria, that the, any disk-like region is correctable. In particular, this entire disk on the torus is going to be correctable. Now, since we are using the purity boundary condition, I can redraw the same figure as like this. And sliding a little, a little bit further, it would look like this. Clear? And just slide this thing over here using the period boundary condition, and then slide this thing over a little, a little bit. Okay, so the, the black thing is correctable. Now, using the cleaning lemma, if you remem remember, if there's a, a correctable region on the sum subset of qubits, then you can find a complete set of logical representatives on the complement. We, we proved it by the dimension counting. So in particular, all the logical operator can be found here. I'm not assuming it is the Tori code. I'm just deriving it under that uh, error correction criteria. Okay, now let's draw it a little bit bigger. So we found a, a union of two strips. That supports all logical operators. And, well, the argument is topological. So I could have another region that is a union of two vertical and horizontal strips that supports well, another set of complete, another complete set of logical representatives. Now let's, uh, let's think about whether we can do the similar thing as here. We, we apply some uh, transverse or gate, it's unitary, in particular it is a, qu a quantum circuit of some small depth and then hope that some interesting is induced at the logical space. Now, after uh, the application of that small depth quantum circuit transversal operation that will induce, but it, that assumed to induce logical operation in the logical space, my, by the light, light cone argument, my red strip will, will fatten. The post uh, uh, transversal gate my, I have a complete set of logical operators on that slightly thickened uh, region. That's no problem. So all I have to do to figure out what the induced logical operation is, I only have to look at this fattened strip and the fattened operator. And let the evolved operator be U and let any logical operator supported on, uh, uh, on, on, um, on yellow be P. Uh, oh, I can use the chalk. And now consider this. A group commutator. It's a, well, U is itself a quantum circuit. The starting point was a Pauli operator, a quantum circuit of depth one 
conjugated by the some small depth quantum circuit again. So U itself is a quantum circuit supported on the red region. P is also a quantum circuit. Now look at this region, or oh, well, I'm sorry, look at here. The red thing appears here and there twice. So by the, the light cone canceling argument, anything that was supported here will cancel off. What about here? The same argument, they will drop off from P. So I end up with the operator, if I take a group commutator, to be an operator supported on the crossing point. So sum operator A, tensor with the sum operator and the B. But we've done this you know, many times. It's the disk-like region far separated. They are both correctable simultaneously. So, and we know that everything here is a logical operator. Uh, P is chosen to be logical. U is assumed to be logical because it's the, it is a, a result of the uh, small depth quantum circuit deformation that we want to study. It's induced action. So everything is logical. Supported on a dis two disk-like regions, that is correctable. So all it can be is just a scalar. Now, what was P? P was arbitrary poly logical operator. Now let's work in the exclusively on the, on, on the logical space. So it's a finite QB problem. Um, if U is a small depth quantum, uh, I'm sorry, U, if U is an operator, so it will have some poly operator expansion because poly operator is a, is a complete basis. Now, this equation says that if I conjugated U by P, then it says it is a scalar multiple of U. How can that be possible? So P, U, I'm sorry. Well, Pauli operators commute up to a, up to a sign that depend, potentially depends on J. Q are complete basis, so the coefficient must match. In particular, sign cannot, be depend, cannot depend on J, it must be uniform. But I could choose P to be some Pauli operator that only selects particular Pauli operator Q. So I could, I could choose a sign to depend on J if there were at least two terms in this sum. So for this equation to make sense, the J can only assume one value, and P U P is equal to some, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, U consists of single Pauli operator, some Q. But what does that mean? U is a result of the uh, logical operator's evolution. My evolution did something, it transformed the Pauli operator to a Pauli operator. U is a unitary, U is a Clifford. That's the Bravi Klinik bound. So in two dimensional Pauli stabilizer code, if the code distance is such sufficiently large, then you can only have Clifford operation implemented using shallow depth uh, uh, physical operation. You can generalize the higher dimension, and the result is that as you go up the dimension, the, this becomes, uh, the U becomes, uh, 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 the, the induced operation becomes an element of uh, the, the dimension level uh, element. So, yeah, and that's what, this is one of the reasons that dimension, I, I'm sorry, the level must start with one, so that it matches beautifully. Okay, um, that's all my, all I have to say. Was there any question? Yes. Uh, so I remember reading somewhere that if you're going from 
Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, this is the this is the proof. Ah, ah, ah. Well, so the, the key word that you want to remember is to take the group commutator because that we are considering the Pauli operator and its conjugation by small depth quantum circuit. All the representatives will themselves uh, shallow depth quantum circuit. So as you take the commutators, except for the possible crossing point, everything will cancel off. It will reduce the dimensionality until you reach the zero dimension, then you're left to scalar. And if you just keep track of what, ha what, has, what has happened in that induction, you, you end up with the Clifford hierarchy definition. Um, so yeah, I, I have used uh, some knowledge from the first class, so it's all connected. Um, and uh, even in, the, in this very, very algebraic looking uh, uh, stuff, if you start to looking at the topological codes, the dimensionality starts kicking. Um, yeah, well, thanks a lot for your attention. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>